also love, I've got a new favorite uh, musician that I listen to. His name is McCray. Um, I've put a couple of his songs on Facebook, and I use one of his songs as a devotion for our great banquet team meeting earlier this week. Um, he's a rapper, but he's also an incredible preacher as well. So I've been YouTubing not just his music videos and some of his songs, but also this week watched one of the sermons he gave. And so I'm going to borrow his introduction because I really like it, and I think it um, sets up what I want to say today. And according to LeCrae, there's a story about Muhammad Ali, and Muhammad Ali was on the plane, and it was preparing for takeoff. So the, the stewardess and air flight attendant came down the aisle and recognized him, and she looked at him and said, Mr. Ali, it's really nice to meet you, but we're about to take off, so it's time to put your seatbelt on. So she continued down the aisle, you know, preparing everyone for takeoff, and she comes back up the aisle, and there's Muhammad Ali, and he still doesn't have a seatbelt on. So she looked at him and said, Mr. Ali, you've got to put your seatbelt on. And what Ali said is, he said, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt to fly. She looked at him and said, yeah, but Superman didn't need a plane either. <laughs> now, no special treatment on here. You've got to buckle up to fly. Only person who can fly without buckling up, I guess, is Superman. But none of us are supermen or women here today. We are all the same. And today what we're going to talk about is how we are all in need of the same grace. Grace is the right and impartial gift of God to those of us who really need it. And that is all of us. And we all need it in equal measure, and that's how God gives it. It's the lesson of this parable that Jesus tells about the vineyard owner, who goes out and hires a crew in the morning, at 9, at 12, at 3, and at 5. And at the end of the day, he pays them all the same wage. Everyone got the same amount, whether they had gone in the morning, or whether they had gone at 5 o'clock. Because, as Jesus said in the parable, that's what the owner chose to do. It didn't sit well with the first group that we'll talk about in a little bit, but what the parable serves to illustrate is that no one deserves grace anymore, or no one receives any more grace than the next person. No one deserves grace anymore than the next person, and none of us receives any more grace than the person next to us. That's what grace is all about. If we deserved it, if we earned it, then it wouldn't be grace at all. And if it was a wage, then it would be a gift. But scripture is very clear, and this parable really emphasizes the fact that grace comes to us by God's choice. The measure of grace we receive is by God's choice. And it doesn't matter who we are and what we've done, how long we are in our faith walk, or how maybe recent we are. It doesn't matter if we've gotten it right up to this point, because I can tell you I know I haven't. And it doesn't matter if we've gotten it wrong up to this point. What matters is that grace is the right and impartial gift of God given to each of us because God chooses to. I think there's a problem, well, I know there's a problem in the church, and I know there's a problem because I can personally speak to this, but, and not just this church, you know, y'all realize that, you know, when I talk about the church, I mean <coughs> universal church, all churches out there, but I see in the church at large this kind of thread of Christians who believe they are more entitled to grace than someone else. I see a thread in churches that if you don't feel the same way, believe the same way, look the same way, vote the same way, believe the same way, then you are somehow less of a Christian than they are. And I can tell you this personally because I was one of those Christians. And this is one of the reasons I left the church is because I was raised in a way, and I, I love my traditional upbringing, but what really started to bother me as I got older is that I was kind of raised in a tradition that taught me that I was less of a sinner than other people. And as I talked earlier about the confession of sins, I was kind of taught, you know, being told that certain people went to hell 
But I wasn't one of those people as long as I came to worship on Sunday morning and Sunday school. And there came a point in my life that I really began to feel like a hypocrite, thinking myself any better than the next person. And I struggled because if I wasn't that Christian that I thought I was, if I wasn't that perfect, less sinful Christian that I thought I was, then maybe I shouldn't be a Christian at all. This idea of grace that I am talking about today changed that for me forever. <laughs> and then that idea that I set up with confession, that I came to realize that not all sinners are going to hell, it's that sinners need Jesus Christ, and they need to be in worship, and they need to be in prayer. Because we are all sinners, not in the hand of an angry God like Jonathan Edwards would preach, but we are all sinners in the hands of God to receive God's grace. And there's not one of us perfect here today. There's not one of us better than the next person. There is no one here less sinful than the next person because we all sin. And that displays our radical need of God's grace that this parable presents. presents. And that the good news is even though we all sit here as sinners, no more or no less than the next person, that God chooses to give us the grace that God knows we need. Because if we claim to be without sin, then we claim not to need God in our lives. Right? And I'm here as your pastor to tell you that I need God. I need thee, Lord. I need thee, as the hymn says. <coughs> and so how do we respond to this kind of grace? How do we respond to this idea of grace being the right and impartial gift of God to all of us sinners, to a world of sinners? Well, here's our three points of today's sermon. And the first I've already mentioned is that when it comes to grace, no one deserves or receives more than the next verse. When it comes to this free gift of grace by God, no one deserves and no one receives more than the next verse. That's that part of the parable that they first grew. They got up in the morning, they went to work in the vineyard, they worked all day, they sweated, and when they got the same pay as the crew that only worked for an hour at the end of the day, they grumbled. They grumbled just like the Israelites in the wilderness that Rahm read about, because they thought they deserved more. <coughs> the problem was the owner struck a deal with them, and the owner kept that deal with them from the morning is that they had agreed to work a daily wage, and a daily wage is what they received. But they felt that they received more because they worked harder, because they were there longer, because they showed up and got to work right away. And yet they proved their brokenness in the fact that when they get the same as the five o'clock crew, they grumble and complain. But they serve to illustrate that the Bible clearly teaches that no one deserves or receives more grace than the next person. And as Paul wrote in Romans 3, this is how Paul said. Paul said that the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Paul says there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift. <coughs> there is no distinction. We are all in the same boat, the Bible says. We are all those given the same wage, the same grace. And we are all those who sin and fall short of the glory. So when we talk about this first point, no one deserving or receiving any more or any less, we have to recognize ourselves in the same boat as everyone else. We are all human. We all make mistakes. Some of those mistakes might come with more consequences for people than others. But when it comes down to it, we are all broken. We are all sinful. And there's not one of us here that deserves more grace than the next person. I do not receive more grace because I'm wearing a collar. I sin with the best of us, I like to say. But this is good news, that even though we are no worse off or better off than the next person, at the end of the day, we all receive the same gift. And the reason we do that is because it is God's choice. So the second point of the sermon is that this grace comes to us by God's choice, not our own efforts. 
That's important. That changed my faith for me. Because I was brought up in a tradition where I had to earn my salvation. I had to go to Sunday school. I had to go to worship. I had to not swear. Um, being a Bengals fan, you know, throughout my life, that's been tough. But I had this set of rules that I thought I had to live my life by, and I set myself up for failure. And when I came to understand that it is not because of my best efforts or my worst efforts that I am saved, but because it is God's best effort shown on the cross where Jesus Christ took on our sin and death, that was the, that's why we are saved. It freed me. It freed me to embrace my brokenness. It freed me to express my need of that grace. And it freed me to live a life where I try my best. But I constantly fail. But I get back up and try again. That's the radical grace I've come to discover and love about my faith. And it's the grace that was offered to all of the workers. You know, in the end of the day, all the workers decided that they set out to work. And even though it seems unfair, and it seems like we would agree with that first clue, that the owner is very clear that everyone got the same wage because that's how I chose to do it. And I love that line that the owner of the vineyard says, that do we envy him that way because he's generous? Do we envy God's generosity? That we would wish more and less for someone else? God's choice is to give us this grace. God doesn't care if we got to set off in the vineyard early or late in our life. God doesn't care whether it's about our best or our worst effort. All God cares about is you. All God cares about is you. That worker that is being called to the vineyard. That's the only measure that God uses. And that's the only reason you get grace is because God chooses and God loves you. Just as much as the person sitting next to you. Just as much as someone sitting in a pew in a church across town. Just as much as the person huddled in the cold on the sidewalk and sleeping outside. God chooses to love each of us just as relentlessly and passionately as the rest. And that is why we are saved. Because of God's first love of us. And Paul is very clear in Ephesians to remind us that this is all God's doing in our hours. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. A gift is given by someone who loves you. A gift is given because someone chooses to give you a gift. Our salvation is a gift for the same reasons. Not because of anything we have done, but simply because God chooses to love us. That's grace. That's what grace is all about. And so what do we do when we receive such grace? When we all realize that we are sinners, that we don't deserve or receive any more grace than the next, and when we all realize that God chooses and God loves us, and that's why we've been given grace, what do we do? Well, at some point we have to face this idea in the story that the workers have to go to the vineyard to participate in the reward. You know, twice we're noted that these workers are just standing around idly. And if we just choose in our faith to stand around idly, it doesn't matter, the reward will never participate in it unless we go to the vineyard. But there's a very important distinction to make in this parable. Is that the owner already knew what he would pay anyone that would take him. The reward was already set and already offered and already given. But at some point, all those workers had to participate in it by working. But let me be sure to put this in the proper order. It was not because they worked that they received the reward. They received the reward and then they worked. The reward was offered. The owner came and said, I will pay you whatever is right. I will pay you. The offer was there. And in response to that, the worker set out to work. That's the relationship in our life between works and grace. That the Bible is clear that we do not work and we do not give the effort so that we get the reward of grace. Instead, our works follow the grace that we've been given. Paul puts it this way. Paul tells us to be steadfast and immovable, and always 
excelling in the work of the Lord. Work is not time that we put in to get paid. That's not how God works. Instead, we choose to give God our work. We choose to give God our effort. We choose to give God our labors because that's how we respond to this amazing grace that we have in our life. The proper response to grace is gratitude. But the proper response to grace is that we want to go into that vineyard and harvest the love and the hope and the mercy that God has there. And to gather up its abundance so that we can go and share it with others. The workers went, but they came back, you must imagine, with these big grape vines. You know, these big plump grapes. And those were for other people. They didn't take home the grapes. They took home the grapes. But what they worked for is the produce of God's kingdom. Because we have to remember that when it comes to this vineyard, and when it comes to where we are supposed to work, parable begins that this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And what the kingdom of heaven is like is realizing that by the grace of God, we have been chosen, we have been loved, and we have been given a purpose to go labor in the vineyard for and with God. Because there are people out there that are hungry for that which only grows in God's nature. There are people out there who are hungry for that plump grape of love. There are people out there who are hungry for that, that plump grape of acceptance that God offers. There are people struggling with their sin and with their failures. They're beating themselves up out there. When they just need to hear a word that God loves them. And that God can help give them the life that they can be living. In short, great grace is everything that is right with the world. Even when we have done wrong. Grace is impartially given to each and every one of us. So there is no one here, no matter how you feel when you come to the table. This table is set for the one who thinks they deserve this the most, but also the one who knows they deserve it the least. That's what grace is all about. And what grace calls us to do is to respond. To respond to God's love by going out and reaping God's harvest of love for others to share it in. Because the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so this parable puts us into the challenge of being part of perhaps the few. Those who will set out in response to this grace and set out into the vineyard and gather up this abundance of love and grace and mercy and compassion and justice that the world so needs today. So my friends, buckle up. We are all in the same plane together. None of us are supermen or superwomen, but we have a superstar in us. Jesus is the superman in our life. Jesus is the one, we've never heard that he flew in the Bible, but he walked on water. And he's the only one that does. And so as our walk, even as we trip ourselves up with these stumbling blocks that we're going to try to give to him in this land, know that God loves you and that God chooses to love you. And God will do that despite your best efforts and your worst efforts. And let us all leave here to go and work in the vineyard zone, to share this grace, to gather God's love, and to share it as a harvest offered by Christ to this world of sin.